Bob Costas. <laughs> You were very Silver tongued. <laughs> you were very nice. <laughs> diminutive virtuoso <laughs> of the sports casting world. There, that's correct. You have that picture I gave to you in your. Not only do I have it, I, I gave Bob a picture. You I'm mentioned it to Stephen the, A. I did? Yeah. Right. Well, I'll mention it again because I had it for 50 years. I cut it out of TV Guide. It was an ad for Howard Coast, for ABC News, like on at 6.30 local in New York. Right, Eyewitness and News. Eyewitness News, and it had the picture of the two news twinks, <laughs> or the weather guy, and then, yeah, I guess the two news guys, and then Howard Cosell. Uh, oh, no, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry. It, it was, was Jim Bouton, Frank Gifford, right. and Howard it, Cosell. It, it was the two athletes, yeah. and it said two guys who got there because they played ball, and one guy who got there because he never played ball. And you said to Stephen A. Smith that you gave it to me, which I yes. appreciated very much. It was a lovely touch after a, 50, a taping of real time. After 50 years in and, my file. And you said that you've regretted it ever since. <laughs> so, no, there it is. <laughs> no, no, I don't. No, no. Oh, there it is. Yep. I don't regret it at all. It has a place of honor in my office. Uh, you have to put it back there. I'll, I'll, oh, that's I'll where it's going. Crack this over your head. <laughs> this you is only a it's fake so, handoff. So, it's so God, such a, so awesome. You know what that um, reminds me of, though? When you almost did a spit take. <laughs> the, when you were on later, oh, this is like thirty years ago on NBC. Ninety four, almost. Yeah. yeah. Um, after David Letterman on NBC, and we scarcely knew each other then. Right. We had a very good show, and somehow we're talking about these old comedy tropes. One of which was the spit take. And Danny Thomas was famous for the spit take. Never so, funny. So, uh, no, uh, we, we agreed. The spit take is not right. Danny Thomas. <laughs> never, never funny. All right. Right. But I then think I'll demonstrate a spit take. Oh, yeah. A Danny Thomas. And I say, and about 1% of the people watching this will get this reference. You know, Uncle Tanus is coming from Toledo on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. And I take a swig and but it was orange juice. <laughs> Just yeah. fuck the whole thing up. Well, it's good to hear you say fuck. Bob. There you go. I feel like you're liberated here. I hope yeah. Are you drinking? Can I fix you something? What do you have? I have some cabernet. I was gonna go Cabernet. Yeah. Oh, well, it, 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 it was really? in the green room. I didn't even know you were gay, Bob, but that's fine. <laughs> I like all <laughs> it's a very be as open minded as I can. Very diverse. Oh, by the way, I was reading Richard Belzer's obituary. Yeah. And they actually quoted in the New York Times, um, I love this. And I mean, that this is a deep chair. That paper is horrible to me, but they got this right. Um, Belzer, you know, was my mentor when I started at Catch a Rising Star. And so it kind of hit me hard when he died. I should have talked about this with Deepak. <laughs> uh, and uh, they wrote about him being Detective Munch on all those shows, yeah. and that's how people knew him. But what they didn't know was that was not Belzer. That's what he did. He make, it was he fell into something that let him buy a house in France. That's right. It's wonderful. But he, that what he was the he was the the black knight of comedy. You know when, when I was at Catch the Bells. Rising, he, the Bells. I mean, he never was able to like get it, find a way to get it out of that little rat skeller called Catch a Rising Star and have it translate to the rest of the world very well. But in his element, he was amazing, and it's it. Quoted one night, <laughs> the guy, don't it said, you know, you didn't want to heckle bells. I remember bells are one saying, it's, hey, it's like kissing a cobra, babe. <laughs> and a guy said, nice jacket. And, and Belzer said, apparently, thanks. I got it on sale in your mom's vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Classic comeback. <laughs> well, it's not something you'll hear from, you know, Uncle Milty. Uh, <laughs> Who actually, he was kind of funny. He could be funny. Oh, Milty, Milty could be funny. Um, should I tell a yeah. Milty story? When Since I was, when I was 13, he was funny. If kids don't know Milton Berle, who was he, Bob? Mr. Tuesday Night. He dominated early television in the right. 50s. Right, even before our time. Mm -hmm. I don't remember him except when he was a little over the hill, but he was still famous and he'd be doing things like the Hollywood Palace. Right. Or, you know, he'd be like guest hosting. You know, there's, there's an arc to show business and boy, the ride down is less fun than the ride up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he went down hard. He did? Yeah. Well, he did. Yeah, he, 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 wasn't, he, he wasn't ushered out with his, with his full blessing. Well, <laughs> no, very few are. 
I mean, show business is addictive and you have to often drag people off the stage. There are very few Greta Garbos who uh, quit yep. early. Or Johnny Carson's. Johnny Carson, yeah. Um, right. never, never looked back. No, no. Remember the last show he said, maybe someday when I find something I'd like to do, yeah, I'll be right. talking to you again. And he never did. Right. Well, he died. So that, so that, 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 that got kind of way. puts an end to it. Yes. Yeah. But n not immediately, but yeah, he had maybe another eight, nine years of yeah, life. Something like that. But he, uh, I bet you he wasn't well because he was like a four pack a day. <laughs> yeah, he was. Tall mall smoker. I, I mean, he would be like playing, t playing tennis. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, this, not too long ago, like your guys on the Mets, Keith Hernandez yes. going to be in the corner of the dugout taking oh, a drag. You know what? There was a cover of Sports Illustrated. I don't know why I saw it because we didn't get Sports Illustrated because it probably cost a dollar. But uh, there was a cover in 1972. I bet you I still have that too, but you're not getting that one. <laughs> <laughs> that I think I saved all these years because I thought it was the coolest thing. Richie Allen. You remember Dick, Richie Allen? Right. Dick Allen. Dick Allen. Okay, he was a, a, I thought he was the baddest dude in the world because he was a bad boy. He was. But he was great when he when he played, mm -hmm. right? Okay, what was he on, the Indians? Or? No, he started with the Phillies, Phillies in 64, okay. and then he was with the Cardinals and with the White Sox. Okay, so in his prime, there he is on the cover of Sports Illustrated, batting helmet on, juggling two baseballs in the dugout with a cigarette in his mouth. Yeah. You remember that? Yep, I do. And I just thought, I want to be that guy. <laughs> yeah, he was, you know, he's one of those guys, and there's a long list, and we've talked about baseball a lot, guys who are better than guys who are in the Hall of Fame, but somehow they're not. Like? Don Mattingly, Dave Parker, Keith Hernandez. If are Keith, all not in? All not in. If Keith Hernandez, who doesn't have enormous batting statistics because of a different era, but he's the greatest defensive first baseman ever. Brooks Robinson's the greatest. Is that defensive, right? Yeah, I think so. Oh. So, and Brooks Robinson is the greatest defensive third baseman ever, and he was by acclamation a Hall of Famer. I have no problem with that. But if he's in, then Keith Hernandez should be in. And Dick Allen is certainly better and was a more feared hitter than many of his contemporaries who wound up in the Hall of Fame. That's the end of that. Wow. People can hear me say that anywhere. Not you don't have to Keith, belabor well, that in club what random. What they, can, what they can't hear is that I heard Keith Hernandez was yeah. what? What? <laughs> I don't know where you're going with this. And that in his heyday, he was just like the ultimate dog. Like <laughs> there, I am not. I am not going to contradict that. I'm not going to elaborate it on it necessarily, but I will not contradict it's, it. It's. I mean, Keith Hernandez with the cocaine. Yep. And he just had this kind of like you know swagger. He brought the swagger to the Mets, right? I mean, they really. Mm -hmm. He was kind of like the Dave DeBusher of of that team. Like he was this guy who comes in and gives them a kind of a grit, right? He knew how to win, he, and he would hold right. other players to account. Right. You know, you look at that team. A lot of teams in sports now, even if they're good, they don't have a vivid team personality. You think of that Met team, Strawberry and Gooden. Yeah. Both dynamic, sort of poignant, because if you asked any general manager in the game, you could pick one pitcher and one position player for the next 10 years. Almost unanimously, they would have said Gooden and Strawberry, and both of them seemed bound for the Hall of Fame, and neither fulfilled their potential, but they're unforgettable. They weren't just dynamic. They were beautiful to watch. And you had Gary Carter, and you had Ray Knight, and you had Keith Hernandez. That team had personality yeah. to it. Yeah, Mookie. Mookie Wilson, right? Yeah. I remember watching it in the bar at the Improv, the 86 World 86? Series. I, when I, was, I was only out here a few years, and just, I think, Seinfeld was there, and, like, all the New York guys were Seinfeld loves watching. the Mets. Yeah. No, I've been to games with them. It's, uh, you know where I was when the ball went through Buckner's legs? Calling it? In the Red Sox clubhouse. No, Vin Scully's calling it. Oh. Red Sox clubhouse. Oh, yeah, because they were going to win. They were going to win for the first time since 1918. There'd never been an interview of a winning Red Sox team because even radio didn't exist then for the World Series. And I'm up on a platform, and the cameras are in place, and they put the plastic over the lockers anticipating the champagne spray. And in comes the commissioner, who was Hugh Roth then, and frail Mrs. Yawkey, Tom Yawkey's widow, she looked like a stiff breeze would blow her from Queens <laughs> to the Bronx. And she comes in, and here's the trophy on the stand, and there's two outs and nobody on base, and the Red Sox are up by two, and it all unravels. 
And by the time the ball goes through Buckner's legs, they'd broken the whole thing down. It was like changing a set in a Broadway show. Wow. They broke the whole thing down in like what seemed to me like a minute. I slide out the door because <laughs> I say to Mike Weissman, who's the producer, what do I do if the Mets tie the game? And he says, get the hell out of there as fast as you can. And I get out and I'm standing in the hallway while the Red Sox are coming down the tunnel and not, not a word is spoken until one guy crashes a bat against the concrete wall and only one word punctuates this entire scene. And I'll say it again. Fuck! And that was it. It was complete ashen-faced silence. Well, they probably didn't want to make their teammate Buckner feel worse than he did, but... Well, they all respected him. He was a gamer. Right. He, was, he was gritty, and he was yeah. a very, very good player. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that just shows the, wow, life can be just a brutal mistress because, like, one oh. mistake, and that's just, I mean, he will always be, he could find the cure for cancer tomorrow. It would be Bill Buckner, cancer mm -hmm. curer, let ball go through his <laughs> right. legs. You he, know. he got two it, hits in game seven after that game six. He had like 2,700 hits in his career. He was a, so, a near Hall of so Fame player. Why are, why are pitchers today, I guess all athletes mm -hmm. to a degree, but especially I see it with pitchers, like, why are they so much more frail? If we're so much more advanced now, we have better nutrition in this. Like when you read about pictures of yesteryear, shall we say, mm -hmm. uh, like I believe in the 1905 World Series, I'm recalling this from either George Will or the... Or from, or from Club Random with Stephen A. Smith only about a month ago. I, I mentioned yeah, that? Christy Mathewson in 1905, three complete game shutouts. Yes, okay, so... How is that possible that he could have done that and today's pitchers can't go seven innings? While I'm watching you with Stephen A. Smith, I'm thinking of what my answer is. Part of it is the size of the contracts and both the player and the team don't want to risk injury, so they protect them. Uh, the analytics say that even the best pitchers, third time through the lineup, they lose something. Pitchers used to pace themselves, even the best pitchers, pace themselves right. through the course of a game. I yeah. remember Tom Seaver saying to me late in his career, I can still throw 95, but I've only got about six or seven of them per game, and I'm right. not going to waste them on the number eight hitter in the fourth inning with two outs and nobody on base. Wow. I'm saving it for when I need it, but they don't know when I'm going to use it. Wow. Now, the average pitcher, and certainly a relief pitcher, comes out and just lets the throttle out right. for 90 pitches, 100 pitches if you're a starter, for that one inning if you're a reliever. That's why so many guys, that and improved biomechanics, why so many guys are thrown in the high 90s, even the low 100s. And so that's what the managers and the front office want them to do. Uh, another part of it, though, is this. This is true in the early stages of any sport. The greatest players are more dominant against the average player because the overall quality has not caught up. The, uh, the mechanics of the game, the approach of the game. So Christy Mathewson, let's say Christy Mathewson's a rough equivalent of Justin Verlander today. Justin Verlander's facing better competition than Christy Mathewson faced in 1905. Right. Right. Well, it was all white. All white. Yes, <laughs> so right there. but also, but also the game itself, and, the know, techniques of the game see, itself have not developed. I must say, I'm sorted down on sports because of, like, I mean, we can talk about this one over refing. But what what makes me up about what I love about sports is I feel like in a in a society that is increasingly full of bullshit. Yeah, it is the last place where I know I trust merit. Winning yeah. out uh -huh. is what, which is kind of connected. What, why I hate refing mistakes so much. Mm -hmm. But it is the last place where merit will always win out. I have complete trust that with all the bullshit and corruption, those are the twelve best basketball players that team could find, or the twenty-five yes. best, players, j the best. There's no such thing mm -hmm. as a nepo baby in sports. There, there are ba there are certainly the scion of players. Right. Yes. Of course. <laughs> right. Like, but, but, but if, they if, had to be good. If Bronny James right. can't play. No. He's not going to be in the NBA no. very long. Dale Barra. Right. right. Dale Barra, as opposed to Ken Griffey Jr., <laughs> yes. who was better than Ken Griffey Sr. Right. This, now, and of course, if you were, if your father was a great player, you have advantages like 
DNA in the genes. Yes. And also, you've been around the game. They were the bat boy or something. So they're not like, oh my gosh, I'm on a major league right. field. They grew up with it. All that is an advantage. But you still have to have the goods and the discipline yes. and lots of other things. There are no Nepo babies, which is, a, you know, this term they have now for yeah. like, which I, look, I have, I'm agnostic on liking them. I don't dislike them. I just always want to say to them, just don't say you had to work harder or, uh, you know, it really wasn't an advantage or once you get the job, you have to do the work. Most of show business is getting the job. So, okay, fuck Nepo babies, <laughs> but... Well, they can open Sports, the door for you, but eventually, exactly. if open, you've got the goods okay. or not, is going to be exposed. But opening the door is not that hard. I mean, opening the door is hard. It's The work is not that hard. A acting is not that hard. I could act right now. I could be mad at you, Bob. That was a little kid in there. <laughs> or I could be very upset. I'm sad meryl streep you have yes. been exposed and it's called you have been outed anybody acting. can do what you do no not anybody can do what she does but anybody can do it like 95 percent of them do fair yes, enough on the on the top level you're right i couldn't uh think of a lot of people who could do sophie's choice yeah or in comedy there's you know i don't think anybody else but jim carrey could have done ace ventura for mm -hmm. for example well that's Stuff. a wild kind of yes talent. there's there are certain things where but in general it's it's a bunch of bullshit anyway <laughs> what was my point <laughs> i don't know uh, we were About, talking uh, oh that you like sports because it's a meritocracy which is why a person oh, yes. who's, who's willing to shrug their shoulders about manifest injustice in society will become all bonkers over something that shows on replay that by a micro millimeter, that guy should have been safe instead of out. I see this just drives me crazy because again, it's so great to have some place in society where you have this trust. Like we don't have it in government. I don't right. have, I don't trust government. I don't trust, you know, religion. Come on. I gave up on that a million years ago. You did? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. I've tried to keep, keep yeah. it quiet. Um, you know, I trust some friend, close friends and, but uh, trust is not a big, but I trust those are the best players they can find. Yes. And that, and it cuts across. There's no equity. There's no, uh, you know, racial, whatever, wherever in the world you are. Mm -hmm. You know, that's true. I mean, basketball is a lot of European players now. And yes. For Africa, everywhere. You know, it's like wherever you are, we will find you. It's that's why when people say about Major League Baseball, which once had a much larger African-American presence than it does now, now it's in single digits, I don't know, 8%, so, something so like that. But players of color, there's a huge number of players yeah. of Hispanic background and increasingly players of Asian background. So you, you can't make a plausible case that the reason there are relatively few black players compared to generations ago is because baseball doesn't well, want them. Again, baseball wants whoever can play best wherever yes. they can find them. I, see, and this is the kind of thing I think you and I are, eye to eye on like we're old school liberals yes you know we were always there for the cause and but then there's people now who just want to like always make a thing where there isn't a thing i i had somebody try to tell me that this was a thing we are uh, and it is for a lot of people a project they should work on getting more african-americans to play baseball it's like why if they want to play baseball it would be a problem if there was a law against them playing as mm -hmm. there once was that well, would be a problem. There are, but they are free to play baseball if they want or to choose another sport or no sport at all. It's not a problem. And gifted black athletes, by and large, are migrating right. toward basketball yes. and but, football. Yes, but it, it, baseball has made efforts to involve, you know, inner city academies, that sort of, sort of thing. Uh, the RBI program, reviving baseball in the inner cities, that sort of thing, I, because I, they want talent. I want to fight. Racism. I don't want to fight non-problems masquerading as racism. That's that's you. You know I'm with you. Know I'm with I, you on that. And I, that's I the don't. Commissioner's ruling. On I that. don't think. I don't think that in order to prove that you're down with a cause that we basically have been down with since childhood and millions of people like us, that in order to prove that you have to nod in solemn assent or at the very least keep quiet over any assertion, even if that assertion is fact-challenged, disproportionate, or illogical. 
But Bob, we can't even be having this conversation because we're two white men. Right. So the, you're not allowed. So before we're even, that's a, that of all the ways of shutting off debate, you got to give the credit to that one. You know, I it's heard. Like, uh, I heard someone. I, I can't remember where. This is maybe three or four years ago, and you were the subject. It happened to be a black woman with some sort of academic credentials, and they said, if you took any 11 year old African American child off the street by their lived experience, they have more credibility to address any racial issue than Bill Maher. As if intelligence, familiarity with the world itself, well, including literature of the past, as if being a sentient human being with, a, with an observant eye doesn't count for anything. Yeah, I can't even, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, never, am, I, no, am I supposed to, am I no, supposed to I, nod an assent to something that profoundly stupid? Just to prove that, uh, that I'm down with the general I, cause? I can answer that, yes. You, All are, right. su you are supposed to. I stand corrected. <laughs> you are supposed to, but I'm glad that you don't. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it is, it's galling, I think, a lot of the younger people, they just don't, you know, they, they shut off at their white or their older, or, uh, which is ironic because that itself is a prejudice. Like, when people come after me, it's very often, especially on you know Twitter and that kind of stuff, which is younger voices. Um, it's just they don't ever engage with the argument. It's just you're old. It's like okay, I, I could be a thousand, but am I right? Because you're not even engaging with that because they can't because they usually yeah. don't have an argument. Which is it's hard to make an argument when you don't know anything. So often they just don't know anything. You're not going to engage on in. The argument on its merits yes. you're just looking for something that you can put out as a disqualifier you're done don't have to consider it if you know me you know that i am big on sleep in fact i'm asleep right now you know what helps with sleep a set of buttery soft sheets from bowl and branch made with 100 percent organic cotton threads that get softer with every wash it's the kind of quality you'll feel immediately the quality somehow improves after washing and the sheets look and feel like a good night's sleep and they are the perfect gift for that special person who wants a lady in the streets and a well-rested freak in the sheets their sheets are made from organic cotton for a superior softness and a better night's sleep Loved by millions of sleepers, they're so luxurious they've been used by three U.S. presidents. And if a president can sleep at night, they must be awesome. Bowl and Branch signature sheets come in 10 versatile colors in all sizes, from twin up to California king. Made without toxins, free from pesticides, formaldehyde, and other harsh chemicals. Ball and Branch sheets fit the deepest of mattresses and are labeled with top and bottom tags, so making your bed is easier than ever. So your nanny will have extra energy to raise your kids. Best of all, Bowl and Branch gives you a 30-night risk-free guarantee with free shipping returns on all U.S. orders. Get 15% off your first set of sheets when you use promo code CLUB at BowlandBranch.com. B-O-L-L and Branch.com. Promo code CLUB. Did you know Food Network had podcasts? Be My Guest with Ina Garten is a podcast from Food Network where Ina invites her friends into her East Hampton home for good food and great conversations. This season features Stanley Tucci, Misty Copeland and Laura Linney, and Nora Jones. Get to know Ina and her friends as they share life stories over dinner and drinks in every episode. Stream Be My Guest with Ina Garten on Discovery Plus and check out Be My Guest with Ina Garten wherever you get your podcasts. Sports, the best place to feel good about race in America, I feel. Again, sports, that's another big check in their favor. When you see the guys on the team, I don't think they're acting for the camera. I don't think they're faking it. The camaraderie? I, yes. Yes. I also talked about that with Aaron Rodgers in these very chairs, and he was like, absolutely. Yeah. You know, they, you can see guys on the team. And, of course, they're young guys. And... uh we're not in, a, of course, a post-race racial era, or even a post there is racism era, but we are in an era where, if you're 22 years old, racism is about the uncoolest thing in the world. Yes, which is not it was not the uncoolest thing in the world when we were 22. That's a huge difference. So I just think there's a reason why those locker rooms 
look as chummy as they do on hard knocks and, you know, <laughs> well, also, and on the field. And you, uh, they're not faking it. They're, also because you have to prove yourself. Right. You really can't again, fake it. And There's again, no the, Nepo stuff there. Again, you can't fake it's, it. It's where that uh, Venn diagrams with the merit thing, because it's when the guy who's not your race, but still got the big hit. And has the goods. Won the game for you. And exactly. The Look, respect. They have such respect for each other. When, when, you hear, when you hear someone who's, and now maybe we sound like geezers, but someone who follows sports closely, maybe they're on some platform or other, they're 30 years old. Larry Bird was pretty good, but he was overrated. Why was oh, he overrated? Yeah. Because he was white, okay? This is when Dominique Wilkins and Charles Barkley and every black player who played against him says, shut the F up up you have no idea what you're talking about this guy not only was good he he was tough he was he, we look oh. at him as an individual yes. are the vast majority exactly. of modern nba right. players who are great black yes but isn't the idea to look at somebody as an individual so why, somebody could be black and they could be a nerd but a good nerd a good nerd they become a scientist why, why can't a white guy be an exception to be a really good basketball player so why did you go back to saying the f i don't know <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Because I, yeah, I, I, I you wanna, got two fucks I, in and you gave I, I, well, up. Well, I figured my limit was three and I want to save one for when it really counts. There's no limit. That's, I mean, that's All right, great. then fuck it. Exactly. Good. There you go. Um, you realize what happens here. Not to you, but to me. This will be like, it'll be somewhere on YouTube. Let's watch Bob Costas say fuck for a minute. But you and it'll be but fuck, you fuck, sat, fuck, fuck, fuck. But you sat down and said, I'm 70, I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> okay, so like, what? what is it? Are you going with that or not? Because I think you got nothing to lose. What are they going to do? Throw you off Major League? Uh, are you, Put me in TV jail? <laughs> are they, uh, like, do the, do the people who are listening to you, and I listen to you, I mean, I you're one of the few, maybe the only guy I've ever, oh, Tim McCarver I used to love too. But like, we'll, I love Tim. We'll, we'll have a game on just to hear the announcer. You, you know, know, I think it, Vin Scully was like, like that for like a lot of people. A, Vin Scully, I never liked him. <laughs> Ooh, there, 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 there's a bold statement. I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't like that voice. It just it grated on me. See, most people I, found it melodic. Melodic. I, no, he was not my favorite. I know. Rest in peace. Nothing. <laughs> let's not have a feud about fucking 89 year to old. To the memory of Vin and to his family. Yeah, yeah. I was Vin, close to him. Really? I loved him. I revered him. Oh. He was, you know, you but you know what? It's a matter of taste. Exactly. Not everybody's my fan either. Even Why? the most popular are not. apologize. Even the most popular <laughs> are not universally right. popular. And he's not here anymore to be insulted by it. And he shouldn't be insulted anyway because I'm allowed not to like him. Did he watch every episode of Real Time? I doubt it. He might not have watched one. Fuck Vince Scully. Oh, stop. <laughs> please. I, can't, I can't be in proximity <laughs> to what? this kind of sacrilege. <laughs> oh, suddenly the <laughs> fuck it guy, I'm 70, is uh, apologizing on two camera. <laughs> okay, um, but uh, but you, I will listen to again. You know, Just, uh, you've. You, but are they, are they really? Are you going to get in trouble? About then? No, about no. anything. But no, no, you no. no. Just fuck pe them. People will have fu people have fun if, with if, it. If they think somebody can call a game better than you, that's what I always say to these people who are like, "You're old." I'm. Yeah, then do it better. That's what you can't do. Well, like, you're old. Yeah. Well, couple uh, take, couple of take things. It. Couple of things. You, you've always been very kind about this. I was doing a game a few years ago in Chicago, Cub game at Wrigley Field. And I got texts during the game, which I'll look at them sometimes during a commercial, like within five minutes of each other, from you and from George Will, <laughs> saying how much they enjoyed the broadcast. Oh. Um, because when I get it right, I hope it has a certain texture oh, to it. It's you know, you can make an apple pie with basic ingredients. Right. Or you can have a recipe that has a no. few additional ingredients, but sometimes when you try that, you don't get it exactly right. And since you brought this up, and this is always something that you have to be careful about if you care at all, which is this. You say something no matter how well you say it, and then somebody takes it and either knowingly misrepresents it or just through their own clumsiness, you get a version of it that makes yeah. it seem as if oh, it's, yeah. not, oh, it's yeah. not worth the effort that it took to say it. But since we're sitting here and we're talking about baseball for the, for the moment, this past October, I did the Yankees and the Guardians uh, in the division series. And I felt like I was off my game. Sort of like a pitcher who still has good stuff, but somehow, as they say, he didn't have command really? that night. And I could feel it. Like in the first five or six innings of the first game, it's the same philosophy, same approach, 
but I wasn't nailing it. It didn't have the same flow and rhythm to it. There were a few awkward moments. I hadn't worked that much with Ron Darling, only two or three games. Very smart guy, a guy I really like. You must I like, like him. I like on, on I the Mets like, broadcast with like Keith Ron Hernandez Darling. and Gary Cohen. They're a terrific yeah. group. Okay, so. Now, Not Vince Scully, though. <laughs> stop with Vin. They, <laughs> now, I don't, I don't place much stock in what two or three people say you know, on Twitter or something, because on Twitter, there's no misdemeanors. There's only felonies. Right. But when I knew myself that it just wasn't what I've generally been able to do, and I wasn't comparing myself to 1995 when I'm doing the World Series, I was comparing myself to August and September of last season when things were as they usually were. And somehow it might have gotten a little better as the five games went along, but it wasn't what I intended to do. Now, why do I care about that? In answer to your question, I'm back if I want to be back to do it. I'm only doing as much as what I want to do. Of I've, I did a dozen Olympics. It's time to leave that. All Most of what I've done is in the past, but I only want to do a handful of things. And one of the things I want to do is a little bit of baseball. Why? Because I've always liked it and because it's gratifying to me when people say the sort of things you say, where well, because you do it differently, and I appreciate that. I don't yeah, need absolutely. a parade. I just like that. So I absolutely. felt like I dropped the ball on that, right. and I so mean, I feel but, bad about it for that reason. Right. You. Well, first of all, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, because I, uh, <laughs> I watched that series, and I because uh, I watch the playoffs in baseball. I don't watch a lot of regular season, but occasionally, if you're doing one, if I see it's on, yeah. Um, especially if it was the Mets. Um, but I never, I, I'm trying to think back to it's only October. I did not have that thought in my head. Oh, Bob's off his game. Yeah, I had a few missteps, but just uncharacteristic. Well, first of all, uh, you know, don't flatter yourself. We're watching the game. <laughs> we're, <laughs> oh, we're I know. Like, I know. We're, we're making a sandwich. You know, we're not, it's not like the, an episode of Fauda. You know, we're, we're, we're not hanging <laughs> no, you're on right. every, it's, it's not the born identity. You're you know? right. So like, do, do I? Um, does the average person notice if you're off your game a little bit? You know, you're the kind of pro who Carson was like this. Like I try to be like this. I don't know if I am, but my goal is when I'm at my best, I'm at a hundred, and when mm -hmm. I'm at my worst, I'm at ninety-five. And I don't think you were too far off that. I don't know what you're talking about. There was certainly. Yeah, I just feel, I just feel like yeah, so there's I, only I, one reason to do it. There are, now, I'm not trying to build a career. I'm not no. doing it for the money. The only reason to do it. You I, enjoy it and you want look, to get into the bullseye or close to it for yes. the people who always no, have appreciated I, your work. I, I so I don't want to let anybody down. Okay. Everybody goes through this in every sphere of life. We're athletes. Exact same thing is what we're talking about. I feel it on real time. There are some nights where I'm like, I don't have my good fastball, mm -hmm. okay, but I can get batters out with junk. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you're right. Th that's an apt analogy. It really is. Oh, the analogy I always use is to fucking that and pitching. I've had I put it in my my novel, I think, but it always made so much sense to me that pitching was like fucking like. You want to be a power, you start out as a power pitcher <laughs> and like, like you're, and then at some point you're like, you're like Tom Seaver. I can throw seven good fastballs and, uh, wait know, for it, wait and, for it. And uh, look, I gotta be honest, I'm working on a knuckle curve. <laughs> <laughs> So now, change the subject. You know who doesn't get enough credit? Your your writers are great. The people who write the captions underneath the new rules. But it's so funny. You've said this before, and this is so funny to me because I am a micromanager. You know, mm -hmm. I'm essentially my own head writer. I mean, I have a wonderful head writer, Billy Martin, who does amazing things. But I have to. It's my of voice. Course. I have to like. It has okay, to sound like you. It, yes. I mean, I'm a. I don't like some guys have. The head writer reads stuff from the other writers and then get a version of their. I read every word everybody writes and sure. I put it all. Okay, so um, uh, what was my point? New rules, <laughs> captions. Yes, the one part of the show I have no part of is your favorite part of the show. That's not my favorite part, but it's a part <laughs> I like. You said it's a quirky that. thing. No, I love it. And you know what I used to I used to do? Uh, I dropped the ball on this, but for years. I would actually phone in my choice for the best caption. And they had a little trophy that they passed around. <laughs> really? Like this week, you, Bob Oshak, had the best 
caption. Right. And next week it's Billy Martin or whatever. Right. And they pass the trophy around. Or they called it the Costas something or other. I don't know what now, it was. I mean, I have been so lucky with my writing crew. I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. Paul McCartney once said that he would rather have a band than a Rolls Royce. And I so feel that way about a writer's room. You know, of like course. some of these guys, we've been together for, I mean, Chris Kelly's been there 30 years. I mean, since the day one, since I laid the foundation <laughs> with my tomahawk. Um, but uh, Billy, you know, a lot of these got Brian, I mean, just long, uh, some people 20 years. And it's like when I did my, I think it was my 60th birthday show. It was the one I was like begging Obama to finally come on. Which he did. Which he did. Um, and I was like, family? I don't have time for a family. This is my family, you know? My relationship with mm -hmm. my life is with my audience. Yeah. And, you know, I and get that. these are the people who are like in on that relationship. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, we, I'm not the kind of person who ever, wants to look back because it scares me. I was talking to Deepak Chopra about it. I was it, watching. The monster that's chasing me. So I only look forward. So we don't get sentimental because I, I feel like you can't afford to get sentimental because then you're looking back and then you're kind of dead already. I know Deepak has a different approach for me. But mm -hmm. I don't know if I can handle that one. Um, but, you know, so we don't like tell each other we love each other, but like it's a, it's a long-term family style relationship we yeah. have little fights but we never really turn our back on each other you know it's it's well, it's special you know it was now i'll get a little sentimental a blessing for me and you may remember this you were appearing in st louis where i lived most of my adult life Yeah, i remember being at your house yeah and came to the house it was a sunday so we were watching some football and my son keith who's now a producer at the major league baseball network is probably eight years old right and he's walking through the house um and you famously do not, do not have much affinity for kids, but you, you recognize what a, what a joy he and his sister were for me. Oh. And at that, and he said something to that effect. I can't remember exactly what it was. Like, hey, it works for you, works for you. So right around that time, Letterman goes to CBS when he doesn't get The Tonight Show and Jay Leno does. Oh, yeah. And David controlled the hour after his. And he offered me, based on my having done later, following him on NBC, oh. he offered me that hour. And to sweeten the pot, CBS offered me a correspondence spot on 60 Minutes. So there's nothing more prestigious than really? that. Yeah. You could have been a 60 Minutes correspondent? Yes. Yes. You're that, not you're not old enough now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been really the new kid on the block. Hello, hello, Morley. Are you kidding? <laughs> hello, Andy. Hello, Mike. Oh my so, God. The so average age of the CBS correspondent is between sixty-five and deep. <laughs> and they've tried to add some new blood now, you know, blood John, John Wertheim, they need new Anderson blood? Cooper, you know, whatever. Hook but me so, up. so anyway, but part of my thinking was my kids enter seven and four. You can say to a kid, hey, let's go to the Bulls game, which I could be calling. Right. You'll meet Michael Jordan. Oh. Let's go to the Olympics. Let's go to the ball game. We'll hang around with, and I had the privilege of access. In my, so my kids had access to all this. You can't say to a kid, I'm interviewing the Secretary of State. You want to come with me? Right. And that was, a, that was a big part of the decision. So you made that decision based on your kids? In part, in large part, yeah. Wow, this kid thing, it's really something. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I always say, you know, like, well, a marriage, first of all, like, I understand why poor people do it, but celebrities? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense to me. And it's sort of the same with kids, but like, it's just, it's such a universal thing, but I, I don't feel it at all. Um, and we know that. So why should you even worry no, about no, it? No, 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 absolutely. No, I mean, so I'm sure Deepak's going to try to for you. change me. Yeah, exactly. It's everything. And, uh, you know, you're happily remarried, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I mean, that's been a long running Broadway show, right? Yep. How long has that been going on? That is... That will be 19 years a long in, a, in a couple of weeks. Wow. you got to do something big for 20, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, 20 will be a big thing. I mean, you got to go out of town. <laughs> no, really. I remember Bob... Out of town or out of the country? I remember Bob Newhart once on The Tonight Show telling Johnny Carson about, I think it was their 25th anniversary and mm -hmm. flying to San Francisco or something. And he said, you know, you just can't go to Chasen's. <laughs> 
it's such an inside well, West Coast showbiz thing. Chastens was yes, it's been gone for many years. Yeah, now, but I, I was even I was too young. I remember it existed. I don't think I was there but one time because I remember like they did not take credit cards. Wow, Chastens only took cash. Usually that's a mafia operation. I mean, <laughs> now it would be almost the reverse. You know the. Yeah. They're definitely going to try to get rid of probably currency and, and right. You know everything will be digital, which you know I don't want to be one of those conspiracy theorists, but it is a level of government control. You actually they'll have everything on you. What they'll have everything on. They you. will, and they'll be able to shut things off automatically. There's going to be lots of, you know, shut off. <laughs> you know, without you being in your car can already be shut off. Sure. By the robot. Our overlords who are going to be taking over very soon. Are you are you uh, are you particularly bothered by the GPT Chat GPT thing where the robot is actually a adult teenager who uh, says I love you and yeah. you saw that story. Ba basically, it, you could I guess in mm. theory write a memoir. Just talk to them and they'd rearrange your words and they'd give you at least some version, at least a first draft that you could work with, right? Are you plugging anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because anyone who knows me knows how technophobic I am. Oh I had a God. flip phone until like five years ago. So, you know, I'm not really. Oh, yes, you know, I remember I didn't, I still don't email you. No, but it... I, I can get emails now. <laughs> <laughs> you but it used to go through my assistant. You Exactly. Yeah. The world go through my assistant. It's like bumming a cigarette. It was <laughs> gross. No, I have an iPad okay. now and I have an iPhone. Oh, I have an iPhone well, right congratulations. here. Congratulations. Look at that right Welcome here. to the 90s. Yeah. Um, okay, so What's yes, that? you're good at texting. Yes. What These are, are my dates. There? Okay. I'm going to be <laughs> March 11th, Bally's. Oh, Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, mm. March 11th, March 12th at the Golden Gate Theater in San Francisco. Uh, and April 22nd, uh, oh, I can't. San Francisco. I'm so anxious to go back there. I've been there so long. April 22nd, the theater at MGM National Armor, Washington, D.C. Oh, that should be good. Um, okay. So, oh, and by the way, March 12th, mm -hmm. San Francisco, that's the night of the Oscars. So right. if you want to laugh, don't stay home. <laughs> you know what the problem is with the Oscars? I mean, I'm, this is not an original observation. Just as sitting at home and getting all excited about the Oscars, there's so much spread out in so many niches on so many platforms, yes. much of it is very good, but the average person can't say, I saw all these movies or I know all these stars and well, I have a feeling about it. It's okay, but it's a lot that it's also movies we don't want to watch because I did an editorial about this last year. They used to know how to make movies that were about something, something real, something important, not something frivolous, and also make it entertaining. Yeah. It wasn't just the lady shitting in the bucket or the Korean grandma burns down the house. You know, these are just like scoldy, like virtue signaling. We're on the right side of this issue. They're just sad. And you know, we call them the downers. They should the addition to the Debbie Down or the right. Debbies. <laughs> Have the Debbies. So this is uh, not sounder. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> from, from, no, from a long ago era. No, they, but they used to know how to make a, a movie that was about something, and mm -hmm. and it was not. And it was still this is a, not Norma Ray, still into, which Norma had a Ray. message, but it's a great movie. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Three Days of the Condor. I mean, I can name a million. The Godfather. I mean, there's just lots of them. Mm -hmm. Anyway, there's one more podcast. I never plug other people's podcasts, yeah. but my friend Barry Weiss over at the Free Press, and I totally want to frequent real time guest and fantastic that she and Nellie Bowles, her wife, have started this fucking great organization that is, you know, th this, this is what we're always talking about. These are basically liberal people who somehow have been cast, uh, cast out. They were cast out mm -hmm. of the New York Times as conservatives. Everybody who doesn't agree with the farthest fringy thing of the woke is not a conservative or Republican anyway. Correct. So the free press, and they they have this amazing podcast now, The um, Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. We don't have to talk mm -hmm. about it, but, I mean, I read, I mean, even the New York Times found the guts, uh, which is yeah, rare, I saw that. to print a piece from uh, one of their, mm -hmm. uh, Pamela Paul, I think, wrote it. And it was, if you just read the quotes Forget her opinion if you want. If you just read the quotes from J.K. Rowling, you would be hard-pressed to say, oh, this is a person who hates trans people. She doesn't hate trans people. 
everybody has to stop saying they hate the thing that they don't hate. Like a, a pro-life people don't hate women. That's another one. They hate women. They don't hate women. They think it's murder, and it kind of is. I'm just okay with it. I'm totally okay with that kind of murder. But it is kind of, it's becoming a life. But they don't hate women. That's not why pro-life people are against abortion. They think it's murder. And J.K. Rowling doesn't hate trans people. I don't know why I'm yelling at you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm yelling well, at you. Here's, here's I'm yelling at you like you're, like well, you're let's, Jerry Falwell. <laughs> let's, let's, let's move it into a specific area <clears throat> where, and I've seen you address this many okay. times, and you mm. always put in all the provisos about, yes, of course, trans is a thing. Of and, course it's a thing. And and we have to be understanding and respectful and a certain and percentage. And protection of the law. Yes. And dignity, of course. That's All the of, old school liberal point of view. Correct. Correct. Way back when, it seems like way back when, I don't know, maybe seven, eight years ago. Yes, that's all. At the ESPY Awards, there's something called the Arthur Ashe Courage Award. Okay. All right. And they awarded it to Caitlyn Jenner, <laughs> seemingly only moments after she had uh, transitioned. And I'm on the Dan Patrick radio show. <laughs> And I don't, I'm not riding in on a white horse looking to make a proclamation. It's about the fifth or sixth topic he brings up. And he says, I know I'm blaming Dan. Dan's great. He's, what, what do you make of Caitlyn Jenner getting the Arthur Ashe Courage Award? And I take every precaution you can take. I stipulate everything. We, we need to be understanding. You're the best at it. You're Bob, the king I, of that. I did all, all the stuff, okay? But You're I, the however, king of the disclaimer. Yes. <laughs> and so i got to protect my own ass here. So, but, I, but I say, look, Arthur Ashe exuded class. Arthur Ashe seems to me at, to be at odds or the, the person who until two minutes ago was was the, the the father of the Kardashian family, that seems to kind of be at odds with what Arthur Ashe represents. Right. Plus, Bruce Jenner's sports exploits are in the 70s at the Olympics, and now we're into some place in the 2000s, 2012 or whatever, whatever it was. Um, so it seems to me that this is a tabloid play. Does that make me transphobic? I, I later said, you know what they can do? If you want the eyeballs, because after all it is television, why don't you have Caitlyn Jenner present the award to Renee Richards, who <laughs> once was Dr. Richard right. Raskin. Of course. And this is not irrelevant. Right. When he, Richard Raskin, Dr. Yeah. Richard Raskin, was playing on the Pro Tour, he was like the 400th ranked player. Right. When he became Renee Richards, don't ask me, ask Martina Navratilova. Yes. She was like the 10th I or know. 12th best. And Martina oh. says she could beat her, but it was tougher right. than, than she would have thought. Okay? Right. This, is, this is a reality that has nothing to do with phobia or bigotry no. or unkindness no. in any way. And, and, and we're, not, we're not denigrating these people no. who made their change, which obviously takes both. Balls. No, God. <laughs> or the, or takes the, balls away. Yes, I'm so, so glad you brought this up because go ahead. Well, so I, so I, I have I didn't know Bruce Jenner that well, but likable enough guy. Talked to him a few times, and I have no problem with Caitlyn Jenner other than maybe her politics in some respect. But there's there's no problem here. Here's he's an adult. She made a decision. Yeah. She's she has all the uh, the autonomy to make that decision. No problem. Dan's question was, what do you make of her receiving the Arthur Ashe Courage Award? Am I not allowed to make a distinction right. here, even with all the stipulations, without being called transphobic or a hater? Bob, you're Apparently an not. You're an idealist, Bob. <laughs> that is your problem. You're, yeah, like Humphrey, you're like Humphrey Bogart in Casablanca. Right. <clears throat> you're, you're and all of this doesn't amount to a hill of beans no, in this crazy tough world. exterior, but you're a sentimental, wishy-washy <laughs> idealist. So I have never once brought anything into... Uh, Club Random, including a thought. <laughs> no, really, I don't. Congratulations. I've made this point many times, but like when I asked HBO if I could do this, they yep. graciously said yes, and I said, I promise you it will be nothing like my real job, which I treasure the most, but, uh, and, and I will not take one minute away from what I normally work. Uh, I would normally take a break in the middle of the week. It's Wednesday for right. a couple of hours to get high with friends. Um, now I'm just doing it with a camera somewhere. Uh, so like there is no preparation. I've never once brought a piece of paper into club but, random, 
But because you're so special to me, yeah. I thought I would break my rule, and I have a piece of paper. <laughs> Peace in our time. I have talked with Herr Hitler, and <laughs> <laughs> that's a Neville Chamberlain joke. Yeah, I, I, the, I, oh, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know you did magic, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be like, was like Ed, a, <laughs> Ed McMahon for Karnak. I, mean, I hold in my hand the envelope. That was the shittiest dove I've ever seen. Okay, so I brought this in because we cover this on our show. Yeah. A and it's, a, it's it's of course I did because I thought of you in sports, but also because we all we see so eye to eye on this like old school liberal versus woke insanity. Yeah. And there's this article in the Atlantic, which is you know look the Atlantic has broken a lot of great stories yeah. and they have great writers mm -hmm. i'm not going to shit on the atlantic i mean i think i made a, a snarky joke about them at the time but i couldn't believe that they printed a article called separating sports by sex doesn't make sense let me say first of all yes it does yes it does <laughs> it sure <laughs> as hell does and i thought no this is a nightclub this is club brand and we don't do anything pr but I just, I, I just wanted to get these quotes right. So I brought this in. Yeah. This is the people actually printed this in this serious magazine. First, it talks about this woman who was trying to join a boys sport. Uh, the panel then set out to determine whether Mendel, Mendel Z's was essentially strong, developed and athletic enough to play a contact sport with boys even though those boys needed to prove no such thing. Yes, they did when yes, they, they did. tried out for the team. That's right. That's why I That's, didn't make my high school basketball team. Right. And you were 6'8 at the time. At the time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a tragic thing that's happened yeah, to you. Yeah. Bob Costas, diminutive, <laughs> vituperative, <laughs> iconic. Don't let me leave here without giving, you, without giving you the Cosell story. I'll, we'll circle back to it. But you're doing the Cosell here a little bit. So. Oh, I I. I you know, when you use the word truculent? I'm doing <laughs> Billy Crystal's Cosell. Right. Do that's, you, that's what people who are not impressionists do. They do impressionist impression. We're, we can't do it for real. We can only, of we course. Can, we can only fucking bite the shtick. You're doing the, Frank Gorshin's Jimmy Cagney. Exactly. For the, for the, for the 80 year olds in the audience. <laughs> but you know, when you use the word truculent, I'll take you off course here. This is a famous moment Monday Night Baseball on ABC. And Euchre's in the booth with Cosell. Bob Euchre. Bob Euchre. I loved him. But he's still still doing Brewers games on the radio. I thought he was dead. He's, no, he's 89 years old. <laughs> Euchre, I'll be texting you tomorrow. God damn it. He's alive and Vince Scully's dead? That's just wrong. So Continue any, with your story. Anyway, so Euchre, Euchre is sitting alongside Cosell. And Cosell says something that Euchre finds questionable about strategy. And Euchre challenges him. And Cosell says, Euchre. You're awfully truculent tonight, but then you probably don't know what truculent means. Uh, and Euchre says, yes, I do, Howard. If you had a truck and I borrowed it, that would be a truculent. <laughs> Which proves he's way smarter than Howard Cosell. I mean, I loved Howard Cosell. I gave you that whole thing. But, I mean, that's just a level that... Above. Although, I will say this. Um, my father was in radio, okay? Yeah. And he had to do, this was the era when every radio station had news at the top of the hour. Mm -hmm. And you ripped the news off the wire. There was no, you know, cell phones. Right we used to call there. it rip and read. Rip and read. And he had to do a newscast that came in at five minutes. I think I mentioned this on CNN the mm -hmm. other night. Uh, and had to come right in on time. Yep. And, and I remember my father talking approvingly and admiringly of the fact that Howard Cosell used to do his speaking of sports mm -hmm. on ABC. This was the station I listened to because it was the rock yeah. and roll station. It was Cousin Brucey and Dan Ingram. Dan and Ingram. Ingram. Okay, so all these guys and, and the music, but then there was speaking of sports and it was the same thing. He had to do three minutes. It had to come in right on time. He had never done it before. And it was a commentary. It wasn't just mm -hmm. reading facts. That is kind of a special skill. Cosell was incredible with that. The Monday night halftime highlights, which really were much more meaningful then, because there's no ESPN. There's no highlights everywhere. That's what you waited for on Monday night for kind of your capsule of what happened over the right. weekend, the best moments. And he did all of that without a script. Right. I'm, I was, when I did it on a regular basis, pretty good at that, the kind of clock in the head. But the two best that I'm aware of were Cosell and Bryant Gumbel. You know what? Bryant was great at that too. You were... 
Bryant Gumbel is a giant talent. Yes, he is. Anyway, Coward Cosell. Here's yeah. something that I think really <clears throat> uh, is interesting about cancel culture because you reminded me of something that was a long time ago yeah. before we even had the term cancel culture. I think culture. I know where you're going. He used the term monkey. Little monkey. <laughs> Okay, you just made it worse. Yeah. But he did not mean it racially no. about a, a running back who, and like my father used to say, call me a little monkey. Yeah. Like you, it was like a term of, of a certain my generation. My grandparents would say to me and my sister, come on, you little monkeys. Exactly. Little yeah. monkey. It was in no way intended nor, and Howard Cassell was a very, he was a liberal New York oh, Jewish. Defended Muhammad Ali. Yes, defended very, Tommy mm, Smith and mm, John Carlos at the 68 Olympics. He was a real New York liberal. Okay? Yes, he was. So, and they did not give him the benefit of the doubt, as I recall. And that. Many did if, if I had to like make a, uh, okay, moment where it began it's probably not that exact moment but that's close well, here's the that's thing that's a long time ago and it was exactly Even, what is characteristic of today which yes. is no no grace no sense of you made an honest mistake we understand right. that's not what's in your heart we're not stupid we get it no today it's just like i'm going to fake being right. very outraged at that, even though I know I'm not And really I'm not. not going to take into account the massive amount of evidence there is about you and your life right. prior to this. Well, that would take work, looking into the past. Or, or just honesty, because in Cosell's case, it was pretty well known, at least in a general sense, where his sympathies were. Um, even in the late 1970s or whenever it was, that was a pretty clumsy thing to say. He should have been more aware, but he should also have been granted understanding, hey, hey, that was wrong, I'm sorry, it was a bad choice of words, but there, it says nothing about his motivations because he's got all kinds of merit badges on the other side But it's kind of a of precursor, don't you think? Yeah, I, I, I do, and you know what, here's something you'll be interested in. Years later, HBO does a documentary about Cosell, and somehow Ross Greenberg and his people at HBO found an obscure broadcast of a Northwestern football game that Mike Adamley was playing in. Mike Adams was like a five foot nine running back, white guy. And Cosell said, that little monkey is really deceptively fat or something. Okay. So, which indicates, look, it's just a dopey, anachronistic thing that he said. Well, on behalf of all white people, I'm offended and I would <laughs> like to start a lawsuit. Now, now let back, me finish, back to the Atlantic. Let me finish running from my, yeah. I, my paper. The only <laughs> Are you time Joe I McCarthy? <laughs> paper, no, I'm Neville Chamberlain <laughs> in Munich. Herr Hitler promises me Germany is only interested in peace. What could go wrong if we trust Hitler? No, that's not what this paper is. This is an Atlantic article. Okay, Gen Zers are more likely than members of previous generations to reject a strict gender binary altogether. True that. Yep. That was me talking through that. <clears throat> Maintaining this binary in youth sports reinforces the idea, the idea, that boys are inherently bigger, faster, and stronger. Yeah, that's just a notion. A crazy notion somebody had. In a competitive setting, a notion that's been challenged by scientists for years. Where? Where are these scientists? <laughs> Professor Pepperwinkle from <laughs> Superman? <laughs> Where are the scientists? I mean, again, Atlantic, everybody, we were just, Bob and I were just talking about the fact that you can have a bad day. Sometimes you just don't have your fastball. I'm working on the knuckle curve. <laughs> but seriously, you printed this on paper, like you typeset this and you looked at it. I mean, and you weren't high. May I continue? Yeah. Decades of research have shown that sex is more complex than we may think. Okay. Again, starting off with a banality no one to disagree with. And those sex differences in sports show advantages for men. Researchers still don't know how much of this is due attributable to biological difference versus the lack of support provided to women athletes to reach their highest potential. Right. I bring this paragraph up because in 2002, you were doing your show on HBO, mm -hmm. the first right. version of it. Yep. I did a piece for it. On oh, yes. Title Nine. Yes, you did. Title Nine. Would you like to explain Title Nine, Bob Costas? Well, 
Title IX, which was a progressive piece of legislation in the best sense of the word. Again, progressive. In the, <laughs> in Nixon, the, in the, in Nixon, the old sense. In the Nixon administration. The old bad progressives. Bas- basically created equality. The stupid ones. In scholastic in. sports. What? With, with, that yes. funds and res- resources would go well, toward uh, girls was, and women's sports in equal measure to men. It was 1971. Nixon was president. Yep. And it basically said you have to... Now, there was a downside to it, which is part of my piece I did on your show in 2002. Yes. By saying that you have to devote equal funding to women's sports as well as men's, there's a lot of women who didn't want to wake up at 5 a.m. to row in a canoe. So they would just get rid of the men's team because yeah, that, it had to that have was, equal. That was a consequence. It was sort of a precursor of, this, of what equity is. It's not the same thing as equality. Equity is this, like, mm-hmm. okay, well, we have to be equal, so we get rid well, look, of... Here's here's what we have. In one generation, I wasn't the world's greatest athlete, a little better than some people might assume. I wasn't a bad street, you know, stickball player or you? shooting baskets in about? the backyard. Yeah, but, but clearly yeah. I wasn't going to get a college scholarship, but <laughs> the point is that I played lots of organized sports. My sister, two years younger than me, played none. I have a son yeah. and a daughter. And my daughter played pretty yeah. much the same number yeah. of organized sports within a school setting as my son did. That's yeah. in one generation. That's real progress. That's a great thing. No one can say it isn't a great thing. It's just, I mean, <laughs> women just don't want to do the exact same things as men. The fact that we have to explain as this. As a group. Just the fact that we have to explain this yeah. to children who have taken over the internet is ridiculous. Well, let's, let's, let's take the Atlantic's position, or at least that writer in the Atlantic's position, to its logical conclusion. Then it should be this. Okay. Hey, why don't we just have one basketball team well, exactly. at Ohio State well, or at UCLA, well, can, and everybody goes out for the team? Can you imagine what would happen if the worst NBA team... And again, this if you think this is some sort of put-down of women, it's a put-down of God or whoever created this species. You know, and women obviously have other attributes that we don't have. Hopefully it evens out. This is just one where it's undeniable we're different. We are stronger and bigger and taller. And if LeBron James' team, which is not even in the playoffs yet, Mm -hmm. played against the best team in the WNBA, it would be stop the fight. Yes, I mean, what would the score be? Yes, this is just this is it's, just reality. It's and just reality. Maybe the better it's, example to give is an individual sport, and even Serena Williams, I believe, has uh, acknowledged this. She has Serena Williams. Serena has Williams, said, the greatest female tennis player, arguably yes. in history, would not be among the fifty best men among her contemporaries. McEnroe, maybe that's generous. McEnroe said the best seven hundred, and you know, McEnroe sometimes makes provocative statements, but we like John. Hey, we own a pot store together. No, no, no. We, last time I saw him was backstage at your show at, no. uh, at the Hulu Theater at Madison no. Square Garden. So. The, the Woods. Uh, Woody Halton's going to love me for this. But yes, I do have a pot store. And uh, I mean, we share it. It's mostly his. Uh, I'm trying to get more. Um, but the you, Woods. You know, in, look, distinctions matter. So here's, here's an issue related to that. The women's uh, soccer team, the U.S. women's soccer team, has for a long time lobbied for equal resources and equal pay. And the reflexive argument coming from the right or anti-wokesters is to say, wait a minute, they're not as good as the men. And the men's World Cup generates X times more money than the women's World Cup. Yes, this would be a good argument in Brazil. This would be a good, (laughs) really, but it's not a good argument here. Because it's a pretty simple Google search if you haven't been paying attention. The U.S. men can't even get into the quarterfinals. The women win the World Cup and they win the Olympic gold medal on a regular basis. Even if you think Megan Rapino is at times a little obnoxious, that has nothing to do with it. In this particular, in this particular context, they deserve to be compensated. Who's Megan Rapino? Megan Rapino is the most prominent player on the women's team. Purple hair. You know, very outspoken. I knew I, that, Bob. I was testing you. Yeah. <laughs> but so, you know. I don't watch women's sports. And if you think that's sexist, let me put this into the <laughs> mix. I also don't watch college sports. 
I watch pro sports. I already think that I spend too much time so watching. You're not going to watch. You're not going to watch the Final Four. In I don't watch basketball. any basketball. Did you watch Bird and Magic when they were in college? Absolutely not. You waited for I, them to get to the NBA. Exactly. You didn't even know who they were. When who's this guy on the Celtics and who's this guy on the Lakers? When I already feel I waste too much time watching sports and have wasted too much of my life watching sports. The last thing in the world I want to do is increase my amount of sports I have to monitor. I watch the American sports, not hockey, not soccer. Ooh. I watch baseball, football, and basketball, and only the playoffs in each one, really. Well, football I watch on Sunday, but it's only... You watch the Mets. It's only once a week. You watch plus the Mets Monday, Thursday. Plus Thursday. Right. <laughs> Sometimes on Saturday. But other than that, it's only once a week. By the way, at the Olympics, oh, which I know a bit about... By the way... At the Olympics, I'm Bob, watching the women's track and field. I'm watching the women's gymnastics. I'm watching the women's soccer in that context. That's you. I'm yeah, me. That's I me. don't. I watch... I only... I want to watch less. So I'm only going to watch the toppity top of the best. The playoffs of the best players. Okay, that's what I'm going to watch. And I'm sorry, that does not include college. Well, here's the great, the, the best players from college will make it to the pros and then I'll watch them. And women's sports is very good for, you know, it's a different, but it's a different level. And I'm used to the NBA level and it's different. And I'm allowed to make that choice course, without I being glad, the bad guy. I am glad there there's lots a- of people who don't watch my show. What's your fucking excuse? <laughs> I, I'm glad that there's a WNBA because these women deserve a place to play and be rewarded to whatever extent, deserve a place to play beyond college, (laughs) and there's an audience for it. But no one should apologize or scold somebody because the audience for that is not as large as for the NBA, because as Bill Burr has pointed out, the, the female audience for the WNBA is not as large as the female audience for the NBA. That's right. (laughs) That's just in the stands. All right. Let me finish uh, here this. Um, the strict segregation we've instilled in sports at all levels gives the impression that men and women have completely different capabilities. Again, this is a quote from someone, but obviously someone they find credible. The fact that you would write this down on a piece of paper just astounds me. The strict segregation is uh, gives the impression. These are ideas, impressions. Mm-hmm. How about this one? The researchers hypothesized that the gap they did find between girls and boys was likely due to socialization. Yeah. Socialization. That's why the NBA and the WNBA are so different. It's what happened in high school. We're talking about also at the elite level. Allison Felix, fastest woman in the world, runs faster than 99.999% of all men, but not as fast as Usain Bolt. Not as fast as high school runners who are men. Well, that she's pretty, you know, not some of them, well, some I, of them, but, right. but maybe that's not right. But I've heard people in the know, maybe they don't know, tell me that that's the ta- the case that that male, the top male high school runners. And I don't know why they wouldn't, because you're probably the best you are when you're in high school. I mean, you're 18. Yeah. You get additional whatever training, whatever. It is, the whatever. point remains that women and men are different biologically as far as strength and stuff that matters in sports. And, and the fact if, that we are debating if stuff. If you obliterated that, if you obliterated that, then all the really admirable female athletes would be off the stage. But, Allison Felix would not have a gold medal. She wouldn't even be in the field. But how can we solve our problems when we're like stuck debating things that shouldn't be debatable to begin with? Right. Like you can't, like we, we it's like being stuck in that place in a relationship. We're like, we can't get back to the bliss because we're still arguing about what happened in the diner. <laughs> <laughs> but here, look, if I have to re-stipulate this, then I will. I am really glad that my daughter got to play. It was a great, she had a great time. Right. It's a socialization thing. It was fun. And there are levels of skill. She got coaching. She got better at it. This right. is a good experience. And I'm glad that there's a place at the Olympic level and right. at the professional level for people to pers- to pursue it. I applaud it, I admire it, and I watch a fair amount of it. But if we're gonna go where this wants us to go, then women's sports is dead because they'll be playing it's against opposite- boys and men. Well, it's the opposite of Title IX, which was of the course kind of the reason I brought, because yes. and then that, it just epitomizes that here I am in 2002 doing this thing about on your show about Title IX, which, I at, the, which at the time all liberals thought was the greatest thing in the and world. And I still think it's great. I do too. And but what the woke again 
not what liberalism is. So well, you, know, you can have your thing. Just don't take our word because you are a different thing. You are not the same thing, so you can't have the word. It's I can name 10 different examples of this where woke is not building on liberalism. It's the opposite of liberalism. Yeah, it's not by degree. It's, you know, it's different Elizabeth Warren, kind. Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders may be by degree yes. further along a certain track than other liberals. But a lot of what we now call woke is an entirely different mindset. It's entirely different. I saw L.Z. Granderson the other night. I don't know him, but I've read a lot of his stuff in the L.A. Times and I've seen him on television. And generally, I I certainly respect him. But he was making the point that the meaning of woke has been distorted. And what woke used to mean was a certain awareness. So if you yes. were a, if you were a woke white yes. person, alert to meant, injustice, <laughs> alert to injustice, you the woke white person was aware that that with the Civil Rights Act, racism didn't end, was aware and, yes. and empathetic and observant to all these little nuances. Yes. That was woke. But now, despite LZ's protestations, it's been hijacked to mean something <laughs> else and he can't pull it back. So when you say woke, we know you're not talking about that. See, we're good with the original definition, but we're, at, we're right. somewhat at odds with those who claim now to be woke. And this is why when you call a game, it is different because you use words like protestations and like the combination of like a baseball game, which is very old school, and then somebody who's like debonair and sophisticated <laughs> and bringing that to a baseball game is just, it's just, it's just one of those do -si dos that ha its days are numbered. Because people are people just get continually less sophisticated, less intelligent, and you know, I mean, I'm hanging on to my audience, but I it's not it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't not worry me that the uh, the cra the country the people coming out of school get dumber and dumber well, and, and know less and less and can read less and, and don't read they only scroll and, and yeah. this is just not good for people no. who like. Um, want to like engage people on this sort of level, which you engage them on, like somebody like me is your perfect audience for calling a baseball game. Because I'm getting a baseball game, but I'm also getting these sort of witty repartee. It's like Cary Grant is <laughs> doing the baseball game, you know, or, or Noel Coward or something. Yeah, like, that's a little even, much. Even your partner in the broadcast booth doesn't know what you're talking about. You know, like you're, you're making these jokes and these references and he's like, yeah, Bob. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Well, that's 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 why I specifically wanted to work with Ron Darling, Yale graduate. He is good. Roughly of my right. generation. Yes. You know, we get each other's references. The thing is, we need to do a few more games together to well, fall into a rhythm. Like, I always say that one of the ways you can tell if your relationship is working is if you can watch a movie with your partner in bed, um, preferably after you've had sexual intercourse. <laughs> Because then you're in a good mood. And nobody's crabby. Okay. Unless you had to go to the knuckle curve too often. <laughs> I Bob, as long as you can get batters out. <laughs> okay. It's okay. All right. All right. Who's that matter one that saw young and then they traded him to Toronto? R. A. Dickey. R. A. Dickey. Dickey. Okay. I think But I've, he was a right hander, not a left hander. His name is Dickey. I think I've made my point. Um, but if you can watch a movie with someone. And you now, one of the joys of watching a movie with, with someone as opposed to alone is that you can comment on it. You can, if it's terrible, you can share laughs about how right. funny it is and how superior you are to the people who wrote this movie. And it becomes a very bonding experience. I mean, if you're, if you're newly bonding or if you bond, yes. have bonded for a while, this is like, hey, we are laughing at the same piece of shit. Okay. Don't you remember, especially when you were younger, the the movie you took someone you were dating to, the first movie oh. you saw with that girl? Not so much a thing now because you get French Netflix and everything else, but you know when you're 20 years old and you're taking a girl out on a date, you remember what movie you took her to? The French Connection. Mm. I remember it. It was January 7th, 1972. I remember it. It was my first date. I won't say the girl's name because she probably wants to hide from me. She doesn't want <laughs> fame. But I, I haven't talked to her really since we broke up. I would love to connect. Uh, people who are like in the 21st century are on Facebook and do this. But, um, you know, you never forget your first love. So uh, I'm just putting it out there in a bottle in the air. <laughs> but you know, wait, wait. Let me say this, Bill. If she wants to find you, you're findable. Yeah, she doesn't want to find me. Yeah. But... 
we had a wonderful year and three months. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess the acting is so <laughs> not hard, Bob. <laughs> But what was I talking about before that? I really wanted, it was very important to me. Oh, uh, a frame of reference and whatnot. And the point that I was going to make is there are a lot of people out there now frame of reference. that, you know, re references and something I said or a word that I used. There are a lot oh. of people now, if it's not in their frame of reference, they resent it. It's not just, I don't get it. Wait a minute. He oh, referred to something, absolutely. I'm 25 years old, he referred to something exactly. that's pertinent and connected, but it happened in 1956. Not only am I not engaged by that, it's stupid that he that said that. This is always happening on TMZ, where I get all my news. Oh, well. All my TV news. Yeah. I stopped watching cable news, basically. It's, it's just too, it's too, it's, it's too. It's too much. <laughs> but TMZ, I love. I love Harvey. I love, he's going to be on this show soon. Really? And, and yes. And I feel like it, it engages me with exactly what, like, the average person, yes, they're mostly interested in gossip, but they will cover stories that yeah. bleed over into the popular yeah. culture. They break some stories. And it's, and it's Harvey who is, like, he's the character in the play who I relate to. And then there's, like, all these millennials who are right. his reporters. And, like, they just say some very stupid things. You know, it's exactly what you were talking about. And like, I just want to shout at the TV when Harvey knows something that they don't. Mm -hmm. And they're like, you're the asshole. And I hey. exactly, it's like, wait, I'm the asshole because I know something you don't? That makes me the asshole? And you resent it's, it or you feel challenged by it? But look, this has to be somewhat generational. In the it's what, totally generational. The way a lot of this stuff has rewired people's minds and sensibilities, because if it's 1965 and I'm 13 years old, and you say to me, who was Rudolph Valentino? I knew. There's such I mean, I might not have known as, right, as, exactly. as much as, 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 right. much as Mankiewicz on Turner Classic Movies does. And it does, interested but, me. Yes. And yes. by the way, to the to the fifteen percent or twenty percent, if I'm lucky, of young people who like find a show like this engaging, and it's not everybody. Most of them are like that, but the, there's a yeah. certain percentage of kids who are the same as we were, which is when we heard something we didn't know, it didn't make us go, oh, "What stupid thing that could be!" I don't know about it. It made us go, "What's that?" Mm -hmm. and want to know more. And we, lo I looked up to people who knew more than I did, who of were course. older than me. You wanted to be I around them. I wanted to be them. some fucking other 17-year-old, the loser masturbating in his bedroom. You want to be around them. You remember how every family, if they could, every striving middle-class family had the Encyclopedia Britannica or the Collier's <laughs> Encyclopedia. You world spent book. The world we had book. the world You book. spent the 300 bucks or whatever it was yes, of your dad's hard-earned money. Yes, it was a big expenditure. And, but it was there. Right. And so your dad would say, if you asked a question, yes. he didn't know the, go look it up. Go look it up. That was our Google. Yes. But you had to work a little bit. Right. And see, the stupid young people look at that and go, oh my God, that's so hard. Yeah, well, it was life. You know, things happen before you were born. And, you know, but the smart kids are like, oh, that's interesting. Well, how about this? And they, how, it's interesting that they got smarter than we did without Google. Yeah. Yeah, they uh, uh, maybe or, just something to look into, or at least they're, they're in, in their self contentment, they right. can they can think that. Here, here's an example: Game One of the series we were talking about, Yankees Guardians, happened on October 11th last year, 74 years to the day <clears throat> that Cleveland last won the World Series in 1948. So I'm making a larger point. Here are the Yankees; they've won the World Series 27 times. They won the pennant 40 times. Here is Cleveland. Now that the Red Sox, White Sox, and Cubs have broken through in the 21st century, Cleveland has waited the longest. Next year, it'll be three quarters of a century if really? they don't win this year. What okay. they win, 1948? 1948. So, so I say it's 74 years ago today that they last won the World Series. And who was a rookie on that team? Ray Boone. He's Aaron Boone's grandfather. And there's Aaron Boone managing the Yankees. Now, oh. to me, those are the kind of things when we yeah. were kids, those are the little baseball things that were interesting. That's what an announcer does. That's right. That's right. <laughs> if somebody says, I don't care about the 1948 Indians. Yes. Then I, Otherwise, I, I can think, watch the game with some moron. I kind of think that's their problem. So what happened? <laughs> then I oh, moved on to the oh, next that's thing. that's your story? <laughs> and then a guy hit a ground ball to second base. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I had. That's all I had. <laughs> so, listen, before I let you go, and I could do this all night, but <laughs> I probably will do this all night. But um, I have to, because you're 
Mr. Sports. <laughs> this has been mostly You're all, Mr. Sports all sports. And Mr. Smoke. Uh, Mr. Sports and Mr. Smoke have to talk about this. Okay, I was apoplectically angry mm -hmm. at the end of the Super Bowl. I mean, I know it's not something that should engage me for even two seconds because, again, I wish right. I could watch zero sports because I feel like it's an addiction that was put into me as a kid. You know what? I also have did this feeling about it. You need things that are completely mindless, that don't mean anything, to de-stress you and relax you. So, okay, I'm not that... On the other hand, at its best, it's a showcase of excellence. I, I <laughs> at that too. And it's just interesting. It's programming. Yeah. And I don't... It's a drama I, without a script. It's a drama. It's great. And uh, it's from my childhood and whatever. It makes me feel good. I'm not getting rid of it, no matter what Deepak it. <laughs> 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 I'm just not. Uh, but And I feel like I have... Do I watch as nearly as much as a sports nut? No, but I watch a lot. So I don't really want to watch a lot, but <clears throat> football, it'd be hard to give up. So I'm not going to like sit here and pretend. I'm going to stop watching mm -hmm. because some things you do annoy me. But could I just tell you yes. some things that really annoy me? One, this rule about a guy makes an incredible, incredible catch on the sidelines. I mean, just this amazing ballet in motion. Mm -hmm. And they have to Zapruder film it and watch it right. nine times. And if the ball moves like an angstrom unit mm -hmm. while he's holding on to it, close enough. And so they nullify this gorgeous athletic play that no one could ever do any better. And it just makes me fucking hate football, hate Roger Goodell, hate every, it just makes me and hate what, for a, a, a minute until the, you know, the what commercial. What instant replay in all sports was originally designed to do was to correct egregiously missed calls, which you could see were missed on right. the first replay, especially in the most important games. Tell that to Kentucky, egregiously. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You know what I love? One of the, I love Kentucky, one of the things I love about you is like you'll say that and then you'll say, and, and I'm in Birmingham, Alabama tomorrow night. <laughs> Actually, did I read my plugs? I guess I did. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Uh, complaint two. Yes. The end of the Super Bowl. Mm. The holding call? Just, I, you know, I did not go to any. Super Bowl parties that had nothing to do with the fact that I was not invited to any. <laughs> I could have shoved right. my way into a number of Super Bowl parties. <laughs> I chose not to. Yeah. Okay, but I was super happy to be home because, you know, when you go to a party, and I've been to two Super Bowls in person, and it's like, you don't really watch the game. No. It's about... We watched it with another couple. It's about sure. We had a nice dinner. It's the guy, though, is a huge Philly, a you know, Philadelphia fan, so he was, a, he was unhappy about the Eagles, but okay. If you're eating shrimp, and watching a game, you're not watching a game. You're eating shrimp. You can't do both. So, okay. So I'm watching at home, thrilled about that. And, uh, you know, it was 35-35. So, like, Something like unlike that. some Super Bowls, which are blowouts, which are uninteresting. It was a great game. It's a, it, it, right, just what you want. Like, I have no rooting interest in either of these cities. I could give a fuck. The Gi if the Giants or the Jets aren't in it, I don't give a shit who wins. I just want to see a good game and watch one team like, oh, we're down, we're going to come back, and that's what happened. And the that's Jets haven't been in it since 1969. Yeah, and we're not hopeful. Joe Namath. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, where, where, where were you? So, so the last play comes, and like they just took away a great dramatic ending because some dick in his zebra outfit thinks that you know, he is more important or like the letter of the law. I don't know what was going through this guy's mind, but this is the the ultimate, the penultimate moment of the big game of the year. All these people have set aside this day. We've all invested this much time in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, of course, if it's an egregious, as you say, call, uh, foul, but on at that moment, at that time, and why the other refs couldn't have said, you know what, we all get right. it wrong. We all sometimes don't have our good fastball. We're all working on a knuckle curve. <laughs> he got it wrong. And let's play the rest of the game as it should be played, fair and square, yep. between the, the gladiators well, who were doing the job. A general rule in sports has been for officials, umpires, that you try to let the players 
decide the game. Exactly. Block or charge could be called on a huge number of plays, a guy driving through the lane in right. the NBA. In the fourth quarter, again, unless it's obvious, you want to let them play. You don't want the game decided at the foul line. You don't want to call a balk in the ninth inning of the seventh game of the World Series unless it's a blatant balk. Correct. I remember a game, and this may lose a portion of your audience, but you remember it because it involved the Mets. <laughs> lose Nin- my audience. <laughs> How bad is the story? Nin- 1990, 1999 LCS. I'm doing it with Joe Morgan on NBC. It's the Braves and the Mets. Okay. Game six, the Mets come back from a big deficit. Game goes to extra innings. The Braves load the bases in the bottom of the 10th or 11th. Kenny Rogers is pitching for the Mets. Kenny Rogers. Andrew Jones is up for the uh Not the, gambler the Braves. Guy. Bases, no, not that guy. Not, <laughs> not, not, not the gambler guy. Not the Kenny Rogers and the this first one, edition this guy. guy <laughs> no, this is the left-hander. This guy was pitching with, with for the, the Mets? Texas Rangers. Oh, that Kenny yeah. Rogers. Okay. Yeah. Right. Was with the Rangers. Now he's with the Mets. Okay. And so Andrew Jones is up, and the count goes to three balls and three, either three and zero oh or three and one. I think maybe three and zero. Oh. And the next pitch is a little bit high and a little bit outside, and it's oh. called a strike. Oh. It's the right thing to do. The, the ump does not want the pennant decided on a walk in that situation. It's a little bit. I mean, it, 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 you could have uh, called it a strike. You could have called it a ball. I see. It looked to me like a, a, a right. pitch would be called a ball most of the time. Yes. But he's going to let the players decide. Great. And then Kenny Rogers, given that reprieve, threw one way out of the strike zone on the next pitch, and the season was over for the Mets. <laughs> and he walked in the winning run, and that was the end of it. But... But at least you didn't feel like right. something that was marginal took it right. away. When these two teams had gone to the wall all season long and all that, series that's long, an interesting, let them decide it. That's an interesting, that holding call was the only holding call in the oh. whole game against either team, offense or defense, and it had no effect on the play. I would have felt so much better if I could have called you and heard that Kenny Rogers. You have my number. (laughs) (laughs) I know, but it's like, Bob, could you comfort me at the end of the Super Bowl with a Kenny Rogers story? I mean, it's no gift of the Magi, but I (laughs) feel like it really, it it helps me. Kenny Rogers. Remember Kenny Rogers on the first edition? My Ruby, don't take your love to town. Oh, yes. There's an extraneous reference. Yes, I know it very well. We're deep in the minutia now. it, It was a Vietnam song. Yeah, that's right. The soldier's gone off to war and comes oh, back. It yeah. was, uh, I definitely had that taped on my little wall and sack tape recorder that I could tape songs off the radio. That's how I listened to music. Mm-hmm. I taped them off the radio. Yeah. You know, is the <laughs> even though Cousin Brucey was more famous, Dan Ingram was the best talk over guy Danny. ever. I know. He would hit he the was, instrumental yep. butting up against no. the vocal and for the was, millisecond. And he was witty. Yes, he was very witty. I Even as a child who was looking to be a comedian, I knew, and I say child, I was like 12 when I started listening to the radio. I gravitated toward Dan Ingram. He was, he was sardonic. Anyway, did you have a good time here at Club I, Random? I did. Uh, it was everything I thought it would be. <laughs> as long as you set the bar at medium height, it was probably everything you thought it should be. <laughs> I any, had, I had a whole, do you have anything to plug? I had a whole, or? no, I have nothing to plug. No. I had a whole Fox News CNN uh, thing that I was going to load up on, but it can wait. Let's hear it. What do you mean? Well, I, there's, there's a, no, I'm it's intrigued. A, it's a false equivalency. And Fox I, I'm News, a con- CNN? Yeah. Who makes people, that equivalent? They make, say, usually it's Fox News, MSNBC. That's an equivalency. But e- false, even, yes, false. E- even, the, even there, MSNBC, well, they're certainly ideological. Oh, yes. They're, they're much more facts, fact-based. Absolutely. There's a much more journalistic ethos there. I've made the same ethos point. There. Absolutely. And CN, CNN, for whatever its flaws and uh, yeah. blind spots might be, and there are certain things that don't fit a, a narrative that they're not comfortable introducing, even though they're factual and pertinent. That happens sometimes at CNN. But if you watched, if you were someone from outer space and somehow you understood English and you watched CNN for a week and you watched Fox for a week, you'd have a much better understanding of what was happening in the world from watching CNN than from, than from watching Fox. I, I, and what's happened lately with the Dominion thing and the lawsuit yes, and all this stuff yes. that's come out, all that is is what has been obvious to any reasonable person all along, writ large. Right. You know, and Gre- Greg Gutfeld may be a very nice guy. I saw his club random with you. Maybe a nice guy to hang around with. But I heard him say once, with a straight face, the difference between us and CNN is we apply the same principle no matter what the situation is. 
want to talk about a moment for a spit take? Are, are you kidding me? Are you yeah, kidding me? But, you who not only covered for Donald Trump, not you, Greg Gutfeld, but you and the whole thing, not only covered for Donald Trump, but demonized anyone who dared to criticize him, even when they had all the evidence at hand. I couldn't agree more. These just... guys are so in the bag and such a propaganda outfit that the idea that, and as you know, one one of the one of the kind of articles of faith with Fox and their viewers is the mainstream media. The mainstream media. The mainstream media is flawed and could use a course of correction. But the idea that you're getting this instruction from Fox News is perverse. Yeah. Oh, I agree, I agree with all that, Bob. There you go. <laughs> so we end, I, no, we end I, on I, a note of agreement. No, yeah, I do. I when mean, they came into just, existence in the mid-90s, no. they had a chance. You, you remember Bernie Goldberg? He used to be on CBS News and for a long of time course. was on Real Sports with Brian yeah. Gumbel. Yeah, yeah. A thoughtful conservative. Bernie yeah. wrote a book called Bias back in the 90s. And his premise was that there were good journalists, Dan Rather, Walter Cronkite, people he worked with at CBS, people at 60 Minutes. But there was, there was an implicit leaning left bias um, at CBS and other places. He didn't think it was malicious, right. but he thought that it got in the way of bullseye journalism. And right. he, he tried to present a corrective. If that was the guiding principle of Fox News when they came into existence in the mid-90s, that not only would have been okay, that would have been a great thing. Here's a thoughtful, right. honest, journalistically responsible, right. right of center alternative. This is the Wall Street Journal of the air, but it's got to be entertaining because it's television, no, they, they, so we'll have some lively personalities. That's not the way it went. There's a new phrase they use, advocacy journalism. Have you heard that? Uh, yes. And so it's just another example of them saying the quiet part out loud that, like, we're not, I mean, the New York Times used to try to be right down the just the facts and the news that fits the print. And now it's like the people in that newsroom who are of a different generation mm -hmm. than us and just think we're wrong and automatically because we're not in their generation because obviously younger people know more than older people. That only makes common sense. <laughs> but um, they, like they're not trying not to be advocacy journalists. They see no. that as the, the paper has a mission and it's advocacy journalism. Okay, that's fine, but it's not what, you, that but that's that's what the op-ed page is for, right? Exactly. That's how it used to be. And by the way, and the, and on the right, they have long been doing this. <laughs> you know, you know. Yes. The, I mean, the, the the New York Post, and you know, it's just it's entertaining. And I I think sometimes they have things in there that are more uh, accurate than the oh, New yeah. York Times. But they also like are reflexively everything Biden does is horrible, and it's just so boring and tedious was, to be that way. It, it's it was, just so obvious and pre yeah, predictable. It's completely it's like, predictable. I get it. Everything well, one, he does is horrible. One of the reason, one of the reasons why, and I'm not saying this because I'm sitting here. You and I have been on the same page yes, basically for a long time, we have. and we've commiserated about it on yes. on many occasions. And one of the reasons why I think that you're an important social commentator is that we cannot predict where you're going to come down except that where you're going to come down is in opposition to stuff that is just not common sense exactly. that is just at odds with right. common sense there are people who are very funny who i admire um who i can tell you if you this is their topic this week i, I, I know what their exactly. take is and some of them are and it's very are, some yeah. of them are people we both would admire for their yes, careers we won't mention names but no, i would, I, I I would say the, the main difference between me and everybody else who does this kind of thing is i am willing to lose audience mm -hmm. and but they and they are not i think that is actually whatever you've lost has also in turn drawn yeah, of course. audience audience yeah, to you. Of this is you this gotta, is what they're looking for. You gotta stick with your brand. The people that used <laughs> to groan when you occasionally went yes. off kind of the liberal yes. uh, gospel, they're now gone and they've been replaced by people who applaud. Yes. Not reflexively yes. because they're your fans, but no. because they get your point. Yes, exactly. You know, so that this this Fox News, Fox News could have been a really good thing. And I'm not saying that over time there weren't people there who said worthwhile things. And there's so, so much idiocy on the left, the extreme left, right. that it feeds them material no. on, a, on a daily basis. No, I, that's, but, that's always my thing when people say, you know, uh, why do you make fun of, of the left more? Because I'm a comedian and you're giving me material. Okay, pregnant men is funny. Right. You didn't used to give me material. 
okay, a comedian is a guy with a divining rod and it's going to go mm -hmm. where the comedy is. And this, this is why but the conservatives have to, or the Fox News smart. crowd has to recognize this. Yeah. Trump was unique. Trump provided so much material. You can't expect Saturday Night Live. He's not gone. To, uh, he's, he's not, not gone. No, was. But you can't expect Saturday Night Live or Jimmy Kimmel or whatever right. to do as much anti-Democrat stuff as anti-Trump no. stuff. If Trump isn't Bob Dole. He isn't no. Mitt Romney. He, he, he was a, he yes. a comedy bonanza. Exactly. As tragic and awful as it was. Right, he was everything. A comedy Stupid bonanza. and crazy and right. racist and horny and fucking all, his daughter. And, you know, all, well. <laughs> mushroom dick, whatever. All I mean, it, all it, you well, know. Those were the jokes. And, and Melania was like, I always tell my writers, you know some of my writers. Like, yeah, like, I do. They, there's a thing called like, I call it writer's room disease where like they do a joke and maybe it works or something because we explained enough to make it work. And then they take it as like a premise that now everyone understands. For example, Melania came in a crate. <laughs> in their world, everyone understands the concept right. that she can. I understand where it comes from. She's the, the mail foreign order. mail order bride. Right. But like, and then they start doing jokes on jokes on, you know, like, like we all yeah. know it's a crate. <laughs> <laughs> well, but you're but you're we the, don't all know it's a crazy. You're the goal. You're the goalie. You've you've got you've I got know. to make sure that whatever you know that what gets through is what will resonate with, I, exactly. with enough of the that's audience. Where, but you know, right. when you, I'm sure My you've job. heard this. You, I, I, you you want to get up and end this, but now I'm on a roll. I'm <laughs> sure you. I'm, Five minutes and we're done. It's, it's, it's my show now. It's it's all random. The uh, the, the the idea. Have you heard? I wish how, I was on your later, boy. When I think of how much that meant to me in 1994, I felt like I'd re more than even the Tonight Show. Like I had really arrived because it was like a, you know, it was a very prestigious thing. It was a one-on-one. -on -one. It was. It was. There aren't shows like that anymore. No, uh, you, what, you. I don't know you if it would be successful it anymore. I, I love, I've never missed an episode. You, especially the you, rock stars. YouTube. At, YouTube. You put in Bill Maher on later. It's it's on oh, YouTube. Oh, I can't. I can't I, the first I time can't I spoke watch. with you was after I interviewed Paul McCartney, oh. and you called me to tell me how much yeah. you admired it. But you oh. were such a Beatles expert that you started pointing out things that I'd missed. <laughs> I don't remember that. At yeah, all. but it really? was it, it was an appreciative call. I don't even remember Paul McCartney. I remember you talking to um, Glenn Frey. Yeah, Eagles. And I, remember, I, I don't know why you, I remember this, but you, I remember you asking him like Don Henley, mm -hmm. and he was like so diplomatic, an important artist. Right. <laughs> and like, wow, that's that's where they are in their relationship. But it was, I think, right before they got back on tour. Maybe that was per, to promote the tour because 94, the Eagles got it's back right, together. Right and around there. Hell freezes over tour. Right. That's right. Um, but I remember Paul Simon. Yeah, we did three with Paul. That They were awesome. I mean, I remember him saying, uh, you said, like, what songs do you you know, do you not want to do anymore? It's like, well, I, I don't think I'd like to be singing, feeling groovy in Las Vegas. And, and I am a rock. In whatever, you know. Yeah. You know what I, I'm a rock. I, I, like I actually made friendships grew out of that. People I had never sure, met before sat down and it was a different kind of program. That's why we're La friends. <laughs> right. Lasting, <laughs> yeah, lasting no. friendships decades later that's, came, that's came, out, of, great came out of later. Of, one of the great perks of doing a talk show is that you get to meet almost everybody yeah, and the the secret though is to make sure that if friendships do do grow out of them, they grow organically. Yes, not like the first time. Hey, what, what's your number? Right. <laughs> Let's have dinner, and I want to meet your wife. It's like <laughs> like it takes years. Like they are, if you like them, they come on your show again, and then you know over time, it's like I, I don't know, things just happen. I mean, I, I remember Salman Rushdie and I were once at a bar and somebody uh, came up to us and said, hey, it's great to see you guys. I'm a fan of you both. And like, how long have you been friends? And we went, you know, neither one of us could come up with the Which answer because it was organic. But here, now, I don't know. I shouldn't even say this, but uh, that kind of ties into something we were talking about a while ago. In 1989, Blue Jays are playing the A's in the American League Championship Series. And the Blue Jays lose the first two games in Oakland. And they're down like by four runs and Eckersley comes in in the ninth inning. And I say, they put his stats up on the screen and the, and the microscopic ERA and all the rest. And I say, boy, all things considered, Elvis has a better chance of coming back than the Blue Jays. Okay, so now oh, Toronto, the Toronto fans are nuts. You. Toronto fans are nuts. They, they already think the American announcers are against them. And I get off the plane in Toronto 
And it's like that scene in King Kong where the old time photographers are, <laughs> stop, stop. He thinks you're trying to hurt the girl. Right. And so, and so there's on the, on the back page of the tabloids the next day, it's an off day in the series. Jay's hater, Bob Costas Jeez. disembarks in Toronto. Okay. So game three, the new Sky Dome. Radio station passes out 40,000 Bob Costas masks and they hold them up oh, and they're I think I supposed to boom me the whole thing. Okay. And now I have to, I have to register under an assumed name at the hotel because they're going to get th- getting death threats. And Tony Kubek says, boy, it's really reached a boiling point when you have to register under an assumed name. And I said, yeah. And when you feel safer registering as Salman Rushdie, things have taken an ugly turn. Sam, Tony Kubek said that? Yeah. No, I said oh. the Salman Rushdie part. <laughs> Kubek had the, had the setup. I was going to say. Unwittingly. I, Tony Kubek was an announcer? Tony Kubek was great. He was? Yes. I, I remember when I was a kid, he was the shortstop for, for the, the Yankees, New York Yankees but when I was a New York He worked with Yankees Kurt Gowdy, oh. Joe Garagiola, and then me at NBC. Tim McCarver was kind of an amalgam of Garagiola and Kubek, analyst and anecdotal. I remember in guy. the Beatles documentary, they interview the, uh, I forget, the publicity guy, I think, and he's talking about when Paul and John went to New York to uh, announced Apple Core was forming Apple. They had the word before the other Apple company, mm-hmm. by the way. And uh, he says, uh, "Oh, and they went on. He went on the Tonight Show, and uh, Johnny Carson wasn't there that night. It was Joe DiMaggio, right. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Garagiola, <laughs> yeah. like, to a British guy, <laughs> Joe DiMaggio." <laughs> All right, I gotta go. Uh, I gotta go gotta back go. to work. Do we, do we do we have an exit? Is there like a theme song? No, no we've not. I've seen not, this there's program. There's not even a. There's nothing. Club.